Hello everyone, welcome back to DSP vs. the Internet Christmas Eve Edition for 2023. We're now entering part 4 of 6, so I hope you're enjoying the show, and we are now in the standard member submissions. Remember, it is the channel members here who support the channel and also submit all of the clips for this show. Maybe consider becoming a member this week if you want to submit clips for the final episode of 2023 next weekend. Anyway, without further ado, let us jump back into the festive fun and see what else people have nominated. Welcome, all of you. Good jul. This is just a quick general history video. Uh, most of you guys have been following my channel for a while, Whoa. and you're very well read, uh, so you know what I'm about to say in this video already. But there's new people coming into the beliefs and tradition all the time, so this video is for them. And there's a lot of people who come into our religion who are confused by this exact question. So, basic summary: no jul and the winter solstice are not the same thing. In pagan times, it was original. I, I can't really, his music's too loud, isn't it? His music is way too loud. I think what he's doing is explaining the origins of Christmas in Viking, which is cool. I mean, that's interesting, but why is the music so goddamn loud? <laughs> he has to lower that, man. I can barely hear him. Only <laughs> two separate holidays at two different times. Okay. When Christianity came in. They forced the pagans to combine the traditions ah. on two holidays and they put it on Jesus' birthday. And that's exactly why we celebrate Christmas the way we do today. So where did this all come from? Huh. Um, the idea that Yule is supposed to be celebrated on the solstice is a completely new thing and completely wrong. Uh, this was brought into... When was it originally? I'm actually interested to hear when it was originally then religion uh, when you know the Norse religion first started getting uh, some following in the US in the 60s and 70s and what they did was they incorporated a lot of Wicca into it we call this Wicca true today it's people who have not necessarily read the sources but just read some Wiccanized versions of the um, uh, religion that dated like I said back to the 70s and this is probably what you have most commonly seen on Whoa. the Wiccan Wheel of the Year. I've never so seen a Wiccan Wheel of the Year. I don't know what any of that is. Ostara, Beltane, Bel Letha, Lug, 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 I can't even say it. Lunas, Lunasa, Lunasa, Mabon, Sam, ha I've heard of Sam Hain because that's around October time. So Yule, according to this, and the winter solstice is late December into January. Okay, I mean, that, if that, but he's saying that it's not the same as, as Christmas, but it's around the same time according to this wheel, correct? Imbolic? I don't know what any of these mean. The spring, I see, there's the spring equinox, the summer solstice, and the autumn equinox. Okay. So, originally, in actual pagan times, which we do have plenty of sources for this, Yul comes from the Old Norse word Yol. Okay. Now, Yol in the Viking Age was one of the three major sacrifices oh. that was practiced in what would be now today in our modern January time in the midwinter, and it would have... So, here you go. It's a... Uh... A blot for a good year in the middle of winter for a good crop. And a third blot for a summer day. So they do three different blots or sacrifices. And each one's for something. One's for a whole good year. One's for a good crop. Because you're going to grow a new crop in the spring. And then one is for uh, a victory blot for the summertime. Hmm. Been a sacrifice <laughs> to a good crop. Uh, okay. We have a source from an old Anglo-Saxon historian, Bede. Uh, who mentioned that the winter sacrifice took place on a full moon at the start of winter in October time. So their winter started a different that, time than, there would than have ours. Been a bloat halfway through the winter, three full moons after that. Uh, and this was in England, by the way, when they were still pagan and practicing essentially the same religions as uh, they did in the Viking Age. We also have another source, the Kjolnikon of Thietmar of Merseburg, which clearly states that this midwinter sacrifice would have been in January time. We even have Pimstavs, actually, that mark Yule and Look at those. Solstice as... Look at that elaborate art on there. That's pretty cool. Look at that, all kinds of characters that represent different things, I'm sure. Some letters and symbols drove in. I mean, you can't, I can't read it, but it's pretty neat. That's a pretty cool piece of history right there two separate days originally like i said but eventually what happened was one day in the viking age uh, when norway uh, was under the rule of king hokum he was a christian king and he basically took yule and he 
uh, wanted to make the people stop being pagan, so he let them do the same traditions, but he moved it to the solstice. Don't say anything bad about King Hokun. Yes, he was a Christian, and at the start he forced his Christianity, like many other uh, rulers did. But he was the greatest king that Norway ever had, and towards the end of his life he actually reverted to paganism, and he was even said to go to Valhalla. Huh. But one of the things he... That's very interesting. King H Hagen? I've heard that name before. Hagen? I've heard that before. Yeah. <clears throat> he kept Sundays, Friday fasts. So basically, he combined paganism and the idea of the Yuletide season and their, their sacrifices and harvests with Christianity and the birth of Christ, and he combined them into one. He was the one who did it. Hagen? Interesting. All right, we're not going to watch this whole thing, but that's kind of interesting to know that they have two completely different origins. That when we celebrate the Christmas season or the Yuletide season, we're actually not just celebrating a Christian religion thing. We're actually celebrating a pagan celebration as well that was at one point combined together to be both. <laughs> Which would make sense because when you really think about it, we think of, what are a lot of the symbols of this time of year? The Christmas tree, like a spruce tree, right? Um... You know, ice and snow and wintry stuff. Guess what they didn't have over there when Christ was born? <laughs> they didn't have snow. They didn't have spruce trees. So how did it become a symbol of this time of the year? Because it wasn't that. It was a completely different thing first. Right? <laughs> how the hell do you say a spruce tree is a symbol of Jesus Christ? You'd be an idiot. <laughs> so there you go. That's interesting. All right, that was a pretty cool video. As the mother of a 10-year-old boy... I know firsthand just how dangerous. This is the onion, so this is a parody story, guys. Okay. Dangerous video games can be. Not only are they addictive and isolating, but they can teach our children to mimic toxic and sometimes deadly behaviors. That's right. Repeads right and off. And my Michael was no exception. Video games radicalized my son to run around and pick up coins. And now, his life is ruined. All I did, I, it was really bad for about a, a period of about two years when I was a child. I just kept running around stomping on mushrooms I found on the ground. You know, it was disgusting. I was sliding everywhere. It was making a big mess. Couldn't go anywhere. Couldn't go to a park. I'd disappear for hours. Come back completely caked in, in mushroom goo. So I'm glad that I finally got that. I, I had to deprogram my head. <clears throat> it started out small. At first, Michael would... Pick up a nickel here or there and yell, woohoo. But then things started to get more extreme. He'd become so desensitized that he would sprint down the street pointing at the coins, jumping on the coins, and spinning around in a circle when he held the coins. That's when I knew something was very, very wrong. I tried everything to stop it. Taking away his coin purse, hitting him over the head to scatter his coins. <laughs> That's a good one. Hitting him over the head and scattered his coins. I even tried crushing him with the barrel <laughs> to steal his coins. I tried crushing him. But every time, he just went out and did it again. I tried and purchasing comically oversized bullets and throwing them at him with eyes drawn on them and angry faces and co colliding them with his body. The coins, he just kept picking them back and up. One afternoon, I, I get the call that I've been dreading my entire life. It was the police. They said they had my son, that he had entered a grocery store and had done the unthinkable. Michael had gotten his head stuck in a coin store. <laughs> what had I done? What kind of boy had I raised? Oh my God. <clears throat> When they took I don't even want to watch the rest. This <laughs> He got his head stuck in the coin star. <laughs> Hi, guys. Heather here. So today at Grand Touring Automobiles Uptown, we've created uh -huh. a vlog of our... That is a huge Christmas tree. Either that's a weird perspective for filming, or that is an insanely humongous Christmas tree. Like, I have to assume she's like a normal-sized woman. That's like, dude, that's way bigger than any tree I've ever had in one of my homes. It wouldn't fit. Right? We, like, we have to have like a sky-high ceiling for that shit to fit. Favorite things. And hopefully, this helps you decide what to buy your loved ones for the holidays. Okay. 
the hell is this? Our 12 favorite things. Hey guys, my name's Andy. This is my favorite thing, the Lamborghini Aventador. Oh Roadster. man, I gotta get, you know, I was, I was waking up, I woke up this morning and the first thing that popped into my head was last minute gift for my wife. I just gotta get her a nice Lamborghini. I'm just gonna put that on order, have it drive right up tomorrow morning, you know? This is a stunning 2015 Lamborghini Aventador LP looks, 700 looks interesting. Roadster. It has 25,000 kilometers. It's comfy to drive. A it looks like nice leather seats. V12. And it's in a beautiful balloon white with white and black mm. Oh, beautiful balloon interior. white. It's available for 529,000. Oh, is that all? AD. I'll be honest, I actually thought it was more expensive than that. I thought Lambos were like million dollar cars. I didn't know they were only half a mil. That's a Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. This is only a 2015. This is from seven days ago, and they're selling a 2015 Lambo. So that's kind of weird. I guess, is this a used car dealership? Why are they selling a 2015 Lambo? I want a 2022 or 2023. I wouldn't go for the, the 2015 Lambo. What is this, a discount? What is it, a big discount sale or something? Is this a, is this a clearance car? They should admit that. Hi, I'm Maurizio. Ew, what's this? This is my favorite thing. The Lamborghini Urus Performante. Ew, why would you want that? You combined a Lamborghini with like a shitty SUV and then you colored it like ultra, ew. I don't even like the yellow with the black. I don't think that goes together. That is, I hate that car. That's hideous. Oh this God, that's really ugly. The 2023 Lamborghini Urus Performante. The Urus Performante has a twin turbo V8, and this one is in a beautiful Giallo. No, that is shine ugly. Uh, the Lambo looks fine. This Giallo version of the Lambo is interior. terrible. Who would want that? The cool thing about the Urus Performante is you have the amazing Acropovic exhaust. Yeah, it looks like a shitty Hot Wheels. Yeah, it does. I agree. That's the ugly. Hi guys, my name is Majid. This is my favorite thing: the Lamborghini headphones. What? Why do you need to buy Lamborghini uh, branded headphones? <laughs> are they at least good? You know, Lamborghini isn't known for headphones. So do you think these are of any good quality? Master. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let's guess. I'm going to guess the Lamborghini headphones cost $299. That's my guess. Dynamic MW75 Automobili Lamborghini headphones have active noise canceling. They're wireless headphones and they're super. Hold up, no, 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 no. $1,025. You guys can't see it. My logo is blocking it. Are you fucking stupid? You're going to pay $1,025 for Lamborghini headphones. That's not even like an audiophile company. And you're going to spend that much money? You fucking buffoon. This is my favorite thing because I'm an idiot. Here they are. Dumb, I'm a dumbass. Here you go. They are available for $1,025 <laughs> so CAD. I'm Amanda, and this is my favorite thing. What? Lamborghini Urus. No, it wants to say, no, we just saw this. They should have told them no, no duplicates. And this is like powder blue, baby powder blue color. Look at this. <laughs> Next is a 2021 Lamborghini Urus. This has a twin tire. Great, let's skip ahead now. We already saw this. Wait, someone's favorite thing is a tire? Rim and tire packages available for your Lamborghini Urus. If you're interested in the current It's a winter, stupid tire. No one cares about that. What's this? Beautiful Giallo Taurus contrast stitching is definitely... Your favorite thing is a duffel bag? Wow, they're really stretching for this video, huh? Right? <laughs> your favorite thing is a duffel bag. Amazing. Something that will enhance your travel. It's available for $3,400. <laughs> what the fuck did they just say? What did they just say? Three, three thousand C A D. Three thousand four hundred thirty-five dollars for a duffel bag. What? I think I just reverted back before puberty. What? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Can anyone explain? A $3,000 duffel bag? What the fuck is that made of? Are, is there $3,000 of cash inside the duffel bag? Then at least that would make some sense. If you open it and there's stacks of cash. But who the fuck would buy that? 
You'd have to be an asshole. Really. $3,000 duffel bag. Hi, I'm Lily, and this is my favorite thing, Conesa Gregera. I can't even say that. This is our 20. That looks like a race car, doesn't it? Doesn't that look like something they would put on the racetrack? One Koenigsegg Regera. This car was available. It sold. The owner enjoyed it for the season, and now it's back available again. Huh. It's in a stunning Nordic light blue paint. What is with the every car being baby blue? Who the hell wants baby powder blue? With a white interior, and it even has 24 karat gold inlay. The only thing that the, the seats look comfy, don't they? The seats look very comfortable, but outside of that. Okay, how much do you think this is? This has got to be a million dollar car. This one, right? It is available for three million. Oh, three million three hundred thousand. I understand. Okay, gotcha. My name is Johnny, and this is my favorite thing: the Aston Martin DBS. We've seen the Aston Martin. I've driven some of these in racing games, right? Next, we have this amazing 2023. Now, let me tell you, this is going to be very affordable. The everyone knows that the Aston Martin is the most affordable of the luxury vehicles. So I'm going to say this one will be a cool 1.4 million. The Aston Martin DBS 770 Ultimate Volante. This beautiful car is in a spirit silver paint with an onyx black and chancellor. Oh, it's only interior. 658, only $658,000 guys. What a steal. What a holiday steal. I got to actually I got to make some calls right after this, I feel. I think we've seen enough of this video, by the way. Thank you, little Shingabig, for the super chat. He says he tried eggnog. It was tasted really sweet. Eggnog indeed is supposed to taste pretty sweet. Although good eggnog is also savory and has a bite from the liquor. So, what a steal of a deal. I got to call Santa and tell him I changed my list. I need the Aston Martin. All right, let's On continue. December 25th, Christians all over the world mm. celebrate the birthday of Jesus, Christ's Mass, or Christmas. But the stories in the New Testament never talk about the date when Jesus was born. There are only two Gospels that talk about the birth of Jesus, Matthew and Luke, and both of them agree on a lot of things. They agree on the place of Jesus' birth, mm. Bethlehem. They agree on the name of his mom and dad, Joseph and Mary. And they generally agree on the time when he was born, under the reign of Herod the Great. But there is no mention when in the calendrical year this occurred. So why December 25th? A super hmm. popular theory today is that the ecclesiastical authorities chose December 25th to coincide with a Roman holiday, either to help spread Christianity or to put a Christian label on an already popular pagan holiday. I was just going to say, just like they did with the, with the Norse as well. We literally just saw the other video where they combined the Yule season with with Christmas, and now they did it with a Roman holiday as well. I That sounds right to me. It sounds like they just did it with everything, right? Today we're going to look <laughs> a little bit more closely at the pagan origins theory of December 25th for Christmas. Parts of this theory may actually be historical, but there are a few problems with it that should make us a little skeptical. Religion for breakfast is the name of this guy's channel. <laughs> so here are the main arguments for the pagan origins theory of a December 25th Christmas. First of all, by the time Christianity started becoming popular in the 3rd and 4th centuries, the Romans had already been celebrating a huge festival at the end of December for centuries called the Saturnalia. Ah, now the Saturnalia shows... Sat the god Saturn. Okay. ...up all throughout Roman literature, but no single text describes the festival in its entirety. So ancient historians are left trying to piece together a fragmentary record to try to get an idea what this festival was really like. To make matters even worse, the ways people celebrated the Saturnalia differed wildly depending on your region or your era. So that is to say, if you celebrated it in Italy in 100 BCE, you're going to celebrate it differently than if you lived in Gaul in 100 CE. The Saturnalia was the festival of the god Saturn and was at its height celebrated between 200 BCE and 200 CE. Celebrations began on December 17th and they could go for either three or seven days mm. depending on the historical period. A whole week. We say the 12 days of Christmas, they had about a week of Saturnalia. And the festivities could include public banquets or sacrifices at local temples of Saturn. But the biggest part of the Saturnalia was private household feasts. And I'm not talking about small kinship groups. Some Roman households were huge. Like I talk about in another video, the Roman household could include the male head of the household called the Patrofamilias, mm -hmm. along with all his kids, 
his slaves, and his slaves' kids. And these Saturnalian family dinners were pretty weird because they ritually enacted role reversal. The Roman author Seneca writes that the masters dined with their slaves wow. during Saturnalia, which is a huge deal for a society as socially stratified as the Roman Empire. And these festivals were pretty wild. Plutarch writes that the feasting goes on for days, and Marshall writes about Roman freedmen hanging up their togas and putting on brightly colored party garments for the festival. Other Roman authors huh. write about freedmen and slaves alike getting drunk, gambling, and arguing about philosophy. The argument goes that by the time the Roman Empire was being Christianized, the Saturnalia was so deeply entrenched in Roman society that it couldn't simply disappear from the calendar. No matter what, the Romans would be celebrating something in the month of December. So there you go. So they combined so many things. They absorbed Yule and made it the Yuletide season and absorbed all this, you know, the symbols of the Yuletide. They absorbed the Saturnalia and turned the idea of getting together with your kith and kin, but in this case, even your slaves and their families and getting a ginormous family get together with a feast. They absorbed that from the Saturnalia. And so basically Christmas actually is an amalgamation of all of these different holidays into one. That's interesting. We learned a lot today on this stuff, right? Are you guys taking notes? Because just so you guys know, I am going to quiz you all. There's going to be a written test at the end of this stream today. And you have to get at least a 70% score. If you don't, I can't let you go. And you have to stick around on stream and miss your Christmas. So anyway, let's continue. If you love a Christmas story, then stick around. <clears throat> because you're about to discover 25 behind-the-scenes facts about this Oh, and this is short. It's only four minutes. This is perfect. We'll watch this and we'll split the part. Cool. So A Christmas Story, I absolutely love this movie. This is actually my dad's favorite Christmas movie of all time. I watched it a ton as a kid because I used to play it all day. My dad likes to watch it at least once. Let's see what we get here. This movie classic. Peter Billingsley was the first to audition to play Ralphie in A Christmas Story. Ah. But the director, Bob Clark, didn't want to use him at first because he thought Peter was too well known for being on the TV show Real People. Oh, I've never even heard of Real People. So there you go. But Clark looked over Peter's audition tape again and realized he was Ralphie and decided to put him in the movie. Many of the kid actors were actually much older in real life than their characters' ages. No, the funny part is if you look, Ralphie looks pretty young, but a lot of the other kids that are supposed to be in school with him look like they're way older. If you notice, if you take a look at the movie, you'll, you'll notice that. Can you guess how old Peter Billingsley was? Hmm. Make a guess in the comments below and stick around to the end to hear the answer. No. Most of the snow you see in the movie was manufactured with detergent or snowmaking machines oh. used for ski resorts. T detergent? Imagine rolling around in detergent that's supposed to be snow. Ugh, this supposed smells like soap. Oh my god, it was supposed to be Jack Nicholson? Jack Nicholson was the first person considered to play <clears throat> the old man. Wow. And he even liked the script and was very interested to play the part. But he was too expensive to hire, so they went with Darren McGavin instead. Well, Darren McGavin did an amazing job in that movie. I think it was it's better to get someone like him because even though he was also known this became his quintessential role Jack Nicholson already had a bunch of known roles so this would have just been just another one for him while when I think of a Christmas story I think Darren McGavin that's exactly what I think of him when I think that's the role I've seen him in other movies but definitely the Christmas story is the one that I 100% remember him from the most so I think it worked out well all of the exterior <laughs> shots of the house were filmed in Cleveland, and the inside of the house was filmed in Toronto. Ah. So the segment of Ralphie shooting the crooks outside was a combination of two different locations and were shot months apart. <laughs> For the frozen tongue gag, there was a small hole in the pipe where air was being sucked through hard enough to make the tongue stick. Ah. In case you were wondering, Scott Farkas's eyes aren't really yellow, <laughs> but it was just an exaggeration for dramatic storytelling. Little Randy's real mom was on the set during this scene to help him laugh during takes by making fart noises. Ah! The guy standing next to the old man is a cameo appearance of the director Bob Clark. Oh, I didn't know that. To help Peter feel blind, they put tiny pinpricks all over his black lenses to obscure his vision, which worked quite well because according to Billingsley, he was always walking into furniture while wearing them. <laughs> the jump cut from pot to pot wasn't intentional, but happened to be a subtle joke about the mom's cooking. And the director didn't even realize it until after the movie was finished. I don't know what they mean, a jump cut from pot to pot? I don't know what that means. I guess I'd have to watch the movie again. The writer Gene Shepard only had the famous line, you'll shoot your eye out one time in the script. But Bob Clark liked it so much that he used it repeatedly throughout the movie. Tons. 
Yep. For this shot, it took Peter a couple times to walk perfectly into frame, and as a result, whoever was throwing snowballs at him became pretty good at it. <laughs> so good at it that they hit him too hard on this take. So his tears for this shot were real. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, when a, when a snowball really hits you, it seriously stings. For sure. So that makes sense. The toilet lid opening to the cooking pot opening, it showed it. Toilet to cook crook pot. Oh, so they're saying it went from the toilet to the cooking pot, and they're like, it is, uh, insinuates shit in the pot because it kind of looks like it. But they didn't mean to do that. Oh, that's funny. They didn't even realize they had done that. <clears throat> For the parade, they used Disney character costumes before getting permission to use their appearance. Oops. But to their surprise, when they showed the footage to Disney, the executives thought it was great and were glad to have their characters involved in the movie. Oh, that's good. Unlike the Disney characters, though, they could use the Wizard of Oz characters without needing permission because A Christmas Story was an MGM film at the time. Right, they had the same rights. The they had the rights to use it. It was the same company. Okay. And in this shot <laughs> is the writer Gene Shepard, along with his wife on the right. Oh, that's cool. And in case you didn't know, he was also the movie's narrator. Oh, I did not know that. They weren't allowed to close down the store to film the Santa scene, and they had to film this scene in just two days during the late hours of the night. Oh, man. This kid was cast to play this small role because he was just as weird in real life as he was in the movie. What? So weird, in fact, that Peter's reactions to his comments are very real <laughs> because of how uncomfortable he felt being around him. <laughs> wow. Weird. They just hired a real weirdo. The kid didn't even know he was in a movie. They're like, hey, just stand in that line and talk when someone walks up. <laughs> He's like, oh, oh, I like Santa. That's the real one, right? Trello, who played Randy, was really scared of the slide they built for the Santa scene. And the director didn't have him rehearse going down the slide, so that his reaction for the first take would be real. Wow. The iconic segment of Ralphie on the slide had to be reshot later on because of the trouble they had making the close-ups look right. Huh. And they also needed to get a better take of Peter saying his line. The truth is I'm glad they did that because that's one of the most iconic parts of the movie. So it's good that they did reshoot it. To cover the trees in snow, they calculated how much weight the trees could hold without damaging Damn, them. Damn, look at that. And then they sprayed them down with water to let it all freeze overnight to create this shot of a white Christmas morning. They did a take of Randy throwing the Zeppelin into the tree and knocking it over, but they decided to leave it out to avoid complicating the scene. <laughs> Like Ralphie in the story, Peter Billingsley was very embarrassed to wear the bunny suit in front of everyone on set, nah. so he didn't have to do a lot of acting here. And a bonus fact is that he still has the suit to this day. He kept it? They uh. talked over the caroling gag with these actors to make sure the joke about their accent wouldn't be insensitive. And they were totally on board because they thought it was such a funny gag. <laughs> and if you look closely at the store manager, you'll see that he had to keep hiding his face because he couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> so the answer to the question I asked earlier was that Peter Billingsley was 12 years old, even though he was playing a nine-year-old. Hit the like button if you got I bet I bet his classmates were way older than that, too, because they look much older than him in the movie. <clears throat> All right, well... Good stuff. I hope you guys are enjoying. That was a good one because that's one of my, my favorite Christmas movies. That was interesting to learn. Thank you for watching. DSP versus the Internet. Christmas Eve edition. We still got about an hour left. And uh, personally, I want to thank you all for watching this live if you're here. It's very nice of you to spend Christmas Eve with me. And if you're watching on demand, either today or after the fact, I also hope that you're enjoying. Thanks a lot. I will see you all in the next part. Very nice. Happy holidays, everybody.